Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This special edition of the Year in Review features actual cases from my medical practice. The purpose of this series is to highlight key teaching content for the USMLE Step 1 exam, but a more important goal of this exercise will be the constant emphasis on question stem analysis, which represents half the battle in dealing with Step 1 questions. But what actually led to the development of this series was to reinforce how board prep and clinical care are one and the same. By using actual cases, you'll get a sense of how the overwhelming task of board preparation that you have to suffer through applies to everyday clinical practice. As with all 12-day presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the website. I am also happy to announce that 12 Days is now offering tutorial services. For those interested, details are available at the website. So please pause the recording to read and analyze our first question. When ready, advance to question number two. And here is the second question. Full discussion will follow. Do note, this is a continuation of the previous case with the change in the physical exam, lead-in question, and answer options. Good luck. So let's begin. With most questions, it's a good idea to review the lead-in question first and quickly peruse the answer options. In this case, we are asked to make a diagnosis distinguishing between liver, lung, heart, and renal disease. A graphic is included, and I'll have much to say about that shortly. The first thing to note is the description of a progressive process. That is, this is not an acute decompensation, so a diagnosis such as ischemia is unlikely. The patient is also reported with shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is a big ticket item. The number of causes will quickly overwhelm you if you don't have a categorical approach. And here are the big categories, heart disease and lung disease. I include red cell disorders such as anemia just to remind you that these two can present with shortness of breath. Continuing, this is how expert clinicians further divide the categories. Just like students, the number of diagnoses are overwhelming for us as well. We all need to break diagnoses into broad categories. So for cardiac causes of dyspnea, for example, we think about ischemia, pump failure, valvular disease, diseases of the pericardium, and rhythm disturbances. As you gain experience, you will quickly recognize and move through these categories. We'll cover the approach to pulmonary disorders in subsequent presentations. Moving forward, his past medical history describes heart disease and kidney disease. We'll keep these in his differential diagnosis. The review systems goes on to tell us he has no orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. When the question writers emphasize negative information like this, they're making a definitive statement about the diagnosis. They're telling us what the patient has or does not have. In this instance, the lack of orthopnea and PND, in combination with the physical exam that we'll get to, tells us he does not have LV pump failure. That was the entire purpose of that review system statement. Moving on to physical exam, the patient has a normal heart rhythm clear lungs and no extra heart sounds. Clear lungs and no S3 definitively exclude LV pump failure, and the converse is true. That is, when the test writers include S3, they are begging you to identify the patient with LV systolic failure, and the derivatives flow from there. So based on history and physical exam alone, we were able to exclude LV pump failure, valvular disease, and rhythm disturbance. I've also excluded active ischemia based on the progressive nature of the symptoms and the failure of the question writer to include anginal symptoms. Continuing to review the physical exam, shifting dullness and bulging flanks are described. Bro, that's a pathognomonic feature for ascites. Pathognomonic statements are money in the bank. You've been definitively told that this patient has ascites. And that brings us to the graphic. This image has a yellow arrow pointing to the acidic fluid. If you're able to identify ascites, that's great. But if not, the question stem told you exactly what you were seeing. But this underscores my general approach to graphics. They are rarely needed to answer a question. What's more, students are often misled by graphics. That is, you guys imagine all kinds of nasty things when viewing graphics. My rule of thumb is shown. The stem is important, the graphic not so much. It is a rare question where you need the graphic to derive the correct answer. When viewing graphics, please view them in the context of the question stem. 
Sounds rudimentary, but I can't tell you how often I see students allow the graphic to dictate the terms of the stem. To be sure, work in this direction, question stem to graphic, and not the other way around, graphic to stem. Getting back to the question, we have an elevation in the jugular venous pressure that increases during inspiration. That is the punchline of this whole question. Rising jugular venous pressure during inspiration is the definition of Kussmaul sign. This is one of the key physical exam features you need to be familiar with. This is discussed in detail in another 12 days video, Diseases of the Pericardium. But briefly, Kussmaul's is defined by a paradoxical rise in the jugular venous pressure during inspiration. It is paradoxical because the jugular venous pressure should fall during inspiration. This is due to a decrease in the intrathoracic pressure. So now we can bring this home. Just quickly perusing the data in this question, it simply supports what we already know from reading the question stem. So whereas cirrhosis will be the most common cause of ascites, it is not associated with Kussmaul's or any JVD for that matter. When JVD is present, you need to think about cardiac etiologies. Likewise, core pulmonale, defined as right-sided heart failure secondary to lung disease, is not associated with Kussmaul's, and the question stem offered no information to point us to the lungs. And this is one of the golden rules to answering test questions. When analyzing options, pay attention to what the stem tells you, and pay attention to what the stem does not tell you. In this instance, there was no information provided to suggest primary pulmonary pathology. So start stashing away these golden rules. These will help your test scores more than the content covered. Insofar as CHF, this was excluded on the basis of history and physical exam. As for chronic kidney disease, it is present, but it would not cause Kuzmal's as a primary manifestation. And we will turn to his kidney disease in the second question. Let's clear the deck for a quick word or two on tamponade. We already mentioned this is a progressive disorder, suggesting a more indolent process. Whereas tamponade can occur with slow progression of an effusion, as in pericardial mets, that's why I'm talking slow, on step one is usually presented as an acute and catastrophic event, such as seen with LV rupture, or complicating an acute infection as seen with Coxsackie. In this question, the patient has an indolent presentation, and he is hemodynamically stable. But here is another key take-home. Tamponade is described by the absence of Kussmaul's, Got that? JVD is present, but it does not rise with inspiration. The best way to reconcile this finding is to consider that pulsus paradoxus develops in response to that blood returning to the right ventricle. It is the very return of blood that causes bowing of the interventricular septum. So for purposes of the boards, the presence or absence of Kussmaul's is a key distinguishing feature between tamponade and constrictive pericarditis. Which brings us to constricted pericarditis. This patient had Kuzmal sign, which is classic. He had a predisposing cause with remote history of coronary bypass surgery. And in this case, his constricted pericarditis presented with a hepatic manifestation. That is, congestive hepatopathy pathologically described by central lobular hemorrhagic necrosis. Clinically, we just call this cardiac cirrhosis. Other signs classically associated with constrictive pericarditis include pericardial calcification, shown in the graphic, and pericardial knock, neither of which were present in this patient. So returning to the original slide, the question writers were looking for the most likely diagnosis. All options can explain some aspects of the case, but constrictive pericarditis best fits the entire presentation. So moving along to the second question, the patient still has ascites, but now there is no JVD. In this instance, they are just asking us to identify the cause of the ascites. In the presence of ascites, and in the absence of JVD, we can exclude several options, namely all cardiac causes. Insofar as alpha fetal protein, as you know, this tumor marker is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. And whereas hepatocellular carcinoma can cause decompensated liver disease, with ascites, the first step would be to evaluate the liver directly. So the correct answer is C. Hepatic ultrasound with Doppler imaging gives us the ability to assess both the hepatic architecture and vascular flow. In this presentation of a patient with heart disease, renal disease, and ascites, I also performed a diagnostic paracentesis to exclude the possibility of intraperitoneal malignancy. 
As all his liver studies were normal, this patient's final diagnosis was ascites secondary to end-stage renal disease, for which hemodialysis was initiated. As for his shortness of breath, it was multifactorial in nature, including both underlying cardiac and renal disease. So whereas this was an unusual presentation for end-stage renal disease, the discussion and thought process allowed us to consider a broad differential and diagnostic approach highlighting the interface between clinical care and the information you need to know for the boards. We also covered a couple of the golden rules on managing USMLE Step 1 questions. Try to practice these as you wander through the banks. And that concludes this first edition of the Year in Review. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.